All right, so today I want to walk through another quick questions exercise. And I did get a request in the comments of the Reflected Cross-Sex Scripting video to do SSRF, server-side request forgery. So that's what I'm going to focus on today. If there's a vulnerability on my methodology that you want me to do a deep dive into like this and ask the who, what, when, where, why, and how questions for it, uh, let me know in the comments and obviously I'll be happy to do it. That's what I'm doing today. Uh, okay, so let's go ahead and get the screen over here. Now I'm going to start with, with why today uh, and then go into the other questions for the vulnerability because going back and watching the last video, I realized that, that understanding the goals of the vulnerability really helps to prime uh, your understanding for the rest of the question. So uh, hopefully that'll be a, a change that would be good there. So to start, what is server-side request forgery? Um, a, on a basic understanding, we're trying to force a device to make an HTTP request that it does not intend to make or that the owner doesn't intend uh, for it to make. Now, obviously, there's a lot of different ways that we can weaponize that, but that's going to be the basics of the attack. So if we look through to our goals here, the first one, the most common, is to force an HTTP request to an internal service to extract some type of sensitive information. So this is a targeted attack. This is when you know that there's something uh, in their internal network that you want to get access to. And obviously, that could be uh, credentials or an API key or sensitive information that you can use to access a system you're not supposed to access. Um, it could also be, it's very common, especially now that pretty much everybody's moved to the cloud, um, there are internal cloud API endpoints that have a ton of really valuable metadata. So one of the ways I see SSRF uh, weaponized in this way very commonly is, you know, those are well-known endpoints that if you know the service is there, you can make a call to the endpoint. So one, I see a lot of times, okay, I know uh, that my target is hosted in AWS. I know that there are these metadata endpoints that give me valuable information about their configuration, uh, security controls, etc. So I'm going to use that, that SSRF to, to make a call on that known existing endpoint and pull that data back. And then for my, my bug bounty report, that's how I'm going to show the impact there as opposed to just showing that I can make an HTTP request to collaborator. Uh, that's not as impactful. Even though the request is going externally, uh, it's not going to be as impactful as exfiltrating that information there. Um, the next one is to exploit SSRF to scan and enumerate the internal network. So if you don't know what's in the internal network, uh, you can use this SSRF vulnerability to start trying to scan and fuzz and find out what's in there. So uh, typically, let's say if you can inject an IP address and that's making an HTTP request to that IP address, you would try to figure out what their internal uh, networking, uh, the, the internal subnets are, right? So are they doing a 192.168.10 with a CIDR 24? Is it more, today typically you see 10.0.0.0 or 10.10.10.0, 10, 10, 10, CIDR 24 or something. Uh, but you can start to fuzz those those more common uh, IP addresses, uh, IP you know subnets to, to try and find something that's there. So um, obviously this is very noisy, um, so you have to consider that, but it is, if you can enumerate an unknown internal service. Uh, obviously, if you're not doing IPs, you can also do internal uh, DNS names or domains. Uh, keep in mind that most organizations, obviously there's external DNS records that you're going to be fuzzing when you're doing subdomain enumeration, but most organizations are going to have an internal DNS server as well that's going to be part of their intranet uh, that's going to have uh, things like maybe there's admin dot whatever the top level domain is or internal dot top level domain, whatever that is. Um, so you could potentially start to exfiltrate that uh, by doing some fuzzing in there as well. Um, the next is to manipulate or use the SSRF to uh, bypass access control. So at that point, when you're forcing the device to make an HTTP request, it's making it internally to the server. So you now are internally within the network, right, from that server. So you now have the ability to bypass any security controls that are IP based because you can have those requests coming from that internal, uh, internal device. Um, also, even if it's not IP based, uh, it could be something to do with, you know, there, it doesn't have a, well, let's take a word too. Um, there's a lot of things other than IP that it could do uh, to identify the individual. You know, it could have internal headers that maybe you're coming from that server. Um, again, there's a couple examples that are, are not really coming to mind here, but uh, however it's identifying the fact, essentially what you're doing is you're abusing a trust relationship, right? They, they, they inherently trust this device because they believe it's theirs. They only believe that HTTP requests coming from this device are going to be intended HTTP requests. And when you can force it to make unintended ones, you can likely abuse that trust relationship uh, to bypass security controls, bypass access controls, etc. Um, okay, you can also redirect internal requests to external malicious servers. So now that you have the ability to, to make HTTP calls, you can potentially manipulate internal applications to, to further exfiltrate 
um, Dady, if there's some type of a, a tracing system uh, within that, you could within the uh, internal network. Uh, you could possibly make requests to that. This is, it requires a lot of creativity. Obviously, I think you could tell my methodology, I start with the most common and get to the more obscure as we go further down. Um, but there's certainly a lot of services that you can manipulate. You can point it to your external services and you can get a ton of really valuable information, show a huge amount of impact uh, with something that might be overlooked. Um, you can perform unauthorized actions on behalf of legitimate users. So again, this is abusing this trust relationship. You have the ability to make an SSRF and somehow that, when, when that SSRF, when that HTTP request is coming from that server, it is also included being instantiated uh, or has some type of a session or another user. Uh, again, this is not as common, but it does happen. Uh, applications are configured to make HTTP requests on behalf of admins on behalf of internal service users, if you can identify a mechanism that does that and force it to do a server-side request forgery, then you have now escalated your privileges internally in addition to being able to abuse that trust uh, of that device. So that's an additional level of uh, impact that you can show there. Um, and you can finally make malicious HTTP requests on behalf of the organization to damage their reputation, right? So you have the ability to make it look like that device is doing whatever you're claiming that it's doing. So you can have it actually appear. It can be running security scans. You can have it attempt to run DOS attacks to, to do all these malicious things. And it's going to appear as though, worst case scenario, somebody within the company, or the company itself, obviously be the worst case scenario, is leveraging that device to conduct malicious activities. Um, or you can just go and hurt the company's reputation. You can claim that they've been, uh, they've been uh, compromised. There's an attacker within their system that's sending these requests. You can make it look like they're doing really nasty things. You can make uh, changes on blogs that they have, internal blogs, make posts to, to social media accounts and things like that. However you want to do it, we're going back and tracing the IP logs. We will be able to prove that it came from that device. And that can be very challenging for a security team to, uh, to argue against if they don't have digital forensics that shows that the, uh, the vulnerability is there. So that walks through uh, a lot of the ways that, that I believe uh, server-side request forgery can be weaponized. Uh, again, if I'm missing anything or if you disagree with anything, please let me know. I'm always learning. I always want to be correct if there's anything in there. And I know there's always new attack techniques that people are coming up with, so it could be that it's just something that I don't know about. And if that's the case, I definitely, definitely want to know. But okay, so now we have an understanding of why we want to go in. We're going to force this device to make an HTTP request we is, doesn't intend to make. We Now we understand why. So let's look at who. Who is the victim? So in this case, the victim is the organization that owns the device. No matter what we're going to be doing with that, making the HTTP request, uh, we're trying to enumerate information about the organization itself. But I want to have one caveat to that, and that is, Ultimately, the crown jewel of a web application is their customer database. That is what the attackers are ultimately going for nowadays, especially if it's some type of fintech or anything where there's very sensitive information, financial information, social security numbers, PII, PHI, personal health information. That's when HIPAA gets involved and there's huge fines if due diligence and due care are not, not exercised, etc. Um, so with that in mind, an SSRF can be weaponized and combined with other vulnerabilities to exfiltrate that customer data that's going to be in there. And that would ultimately be a step up. So I don't want to say that there's never a time where the customer data and the individual users are going to be targeted by an SSRF, but in most cases, the victim of a server-side request forgery attack is going to be the organization itself. So the next is what, and specifically what technology are you exploiting? Um, so this is interesting. This is an interesting one. It also has some caveats. Um, the, the obvious answer, and you know, this is listed under my uh, methodology as a uh, server-side uh, exploit. Obviously, it has server-side in the, in the uh, name, right? Server-side request forgery. Um, in most cases, and, and honestly, a true server-side request forgery happens in the server-side code of the application. It's never going to happen in the client-side code, right? Because that's that is, you know, you're essentially having a, a fetch uh, or a request coming from the fetch API. That is coming from the browser. You're isolated by cores. There's, that's a sandbox. There's, uh, you're significantly restricted in making calls from there. And the calls are also coming from the user's browser, completely different. But on the server side, somewhere on the back end, that application is taking user controlled input. And it's most likely going to be a URL or an IP address or a domain or something like that. 
and they are not sanitizing it and concatenating it into some type of API in that server-side code that makes HTTP request calls, right? So it's JavaScript, we're gonna have Axios. If it's Java, you're gonna have, what is it, HTTP URL connection, I think was the name. Um, uh, C sharp, right? HTTP client, uh, PHP, you've got curl, C U R L, um, et cetera. Um, yeah, so in one of those uh, APIs, most of them are going to be the same. You're going to instantiate the, the HTTP call, you're going to pass a string to a URL, and that's going to make the call. Um, in most cases for server side request forgery, the vulnerability exists because the developers are taking a value from that HTTP request, they are not sanitizing it, and then they are passing it directly into the string that's going into this HTTP method uh, that is going in and making the, the actual call there. Um, but there are a lot of other, I would even almost call them other vulnerabilities that have the exact same impact. If essentially you're, you're creating a server-side request forgery, but you're just, you're just manifesting it in a bit of a different way. Um, and I think the easiest example of that would be uh, if you're getting a command injection through, say, a curl or a wget, right? So instead of using one of these, uh, you know, code-based APIs, um, what if the application takes that user-controlled input, that string, and uh, drops it into like JavaScript again, right? We've got an exec sync uh, call, or if it's Python, it's a subprocess, or, or PHP, it's a system method call, right? Where it's actually passing that string to be a system call that's going to be run on the server. Now, this is not as common, especially for modern applications, um, but especially, you know, older applications, this was pretty common. There wasn't uh, robust APIs back in the day where you could very easily make these HTTP calls. It was easier to just pass that string on and let the server uh, handle it. So, I mean, that would be a command injection vulnerability, but everything else that we're talking about as far as the, the other questions and the goals and everything, those are all the same uh, if you're getting this vulnerability through a command injection as well. And a lot of times you're not going to know the difference. You probably won't be able to tell. Possibly with the payloads, the payloads will be different, but it's maybe they're not, right? So um, not a huge deal to really understand how it's happening until you get into the granular, like if you got to bypass filters and everything, um, but it is good to know. Um, another way that you can get it is a CVE in the infrastructure. There's a lot of known CVEs, especially on load balancers and, and uh, things like that. Uh, reverse proxies to where you can uh, potentially get those to make a, an HTTP request. So you, you could be, and typically that's going to be coming from a header or, a, uh, or the host header as well. The host header value, I think, is most common. Um, but, you know, understand that. Something. And if you're getting there, that's probably not through fuzzing. You're probably not in burp. You're probably in nuclei or something at that point. You've probably got a long, well-known payload. You've probably recognized that through a, a general CVE scanner there. Um, and then the fourth way that, that uh, I see this, so the technology that you're targeting is uh, cloud infrastructure. There are some cloud infrastructures that if they're misconfigured, uh, you can potentially cause them to make HTTP requests. And I don't want to go through a lot of different ones. AWS. Uh, specifically has a few that are pretty well known and documented. Um, so, you know, as long as everything is configured correctly, that's really AWS and cloud security in a nutshell. If you configured everything correctly, you're going to be fine. But if you have a couple check boxes or misconfigurations, it's going to be harder. How do you fix that? Terraform everything. Or, you know, find some way, keep everything in code. Don't do anything in a GUI because uh, it's so easy to make a change in a GUI. Do everything in code, do it through PRs, have other people review it, you know, double check your work. Yeah. Uh, okay, but that answers the question of what. In most cases, it's going to be the server-side code, uh, but there are a couple other instances that, that will uh, go outside of that. So, uh, Next, we're going to look at when. When are you going to execute the attack? And this one, you know, I said in the reflective cross-site scripting, for most bug bounty attacks um, or bug bounty programs, web-based attacks is going to be... Uh, it's not as impactful to talk about when. Um, with server-side request forgery, it's, it's interesting because there's kind of two different goals. The question is, do you know what you're targeting or are you enumerating for something else that's back there, right? Um, and also, like, are you trying to cert, like, not be caught? You know, are you trying to do it in a way that nobody knows you're there? Are you a real attacker? Hopefully you're not. Hopefully it's a bug bounty researcher, but you still don't want to overload that internal network. So if you're doing a targeted server-side request forgery where you know what data that you're, you want to get, then all you really need to know is make sure that service is up. You know, so if it's something that's running all the time, it really doesn't matter when, because you're going to make one HTTP request. You might want to make it at night just in case they have a seam or something that's going to alert to a request that's, that's out of the ordinary, it might give you a little more time. Uh, to continue building impact on that attack, but for the most part, that's not going to matter. 
On the other hand, if you're doing enumeration, if you need to fuzz for things that are uh, back in their internal network, now all of a sudden you've got to think about what time it is. And there's two different considerations. You know, I don't, it, it kind of depends on which one's the best answer because on one hand, uh, your enumeration is going to be very noisy. So on the one hand, you could do it at night where that's most likely not going to be found or in times where you think there's not going to be individuals that are maybe monitoring a seam or monitoring, monitoring logs, etc. Um, if they don't have 24 hour monitoring uh, already set up. But if it's noisy and they do have anybody's monitoring that, you're gonna stick out like sore thumb. So the other question is, is it better to do it during the day when there's a lot of other traffic so you can hide within that noise? And again, that's a judgment call that you can make. Doesn't typically come up with bug bounty programs, but it's good to think about, uh, good to make sure you understand what a real attacker is going in there so that you can really explain the impact of how they would weaponize that. Um, where, anywhere on the internet, right, it's the same thing as reflective cross-site scripting. Pretty much all the ones we're going to do for these are, are, you know, as long as you have an internet connection, uh, or internet connection and the device that connected to the internet, you're going to be able to, to, uh, to execute the attack. All right, and the last part is how, and again, I think most people know this, um, you know, it's user-controlled input coming from the HTTP request that is not being sanitized, it's being concatenated into whatever string is being passed to that. Uh, a API to make an HTTP request. As I mentioned before, um, most commonly it's going to be a parameter. So you might have a parameter with the title like URL or, or you know, domain, subdomain, something like that that's pointing to it. It could be obscurely named as well. Um, headers. Uh, the host header is very, very common. This, this is probably the main place that I would start uh, to look for this. And a lot of times what you can find is uh, you'll get a DNS call, but not an HTTP uh, request coming from, uh, or we don't hit collaborator as you're scanning. If you find that, try removing a lot of the headers aside from, uh, just because of so the host header, the only ones that you need, so the host header, the connection, um, content links, post request, et cetera, but keep minimizing it as much as possible. And that can actually break the logic uh, to cause it to send that HTTP request as well. Um, whereas before it was only sending the DNS request. It's something very common that I see. Um, cookies sometimes, sometimes especially JOTs will hold uh, domains that maybe will be broken out, but that's, you've got to find a JOT vulnerability, manipulate the signature in order to be able to control it. Um, domains can be stored in local storage. I've seen that before to where they'll pull it out of local storage, send it to the back, make an HTTP request. Don't forget to go in, look at local storage, session storage, uh, et cetera, in there stored in your browser. Those are all attack vectors as well. Um, but yeah, any way that you can deliver that payload from the HTTP request and force that device uh, to, to make a malicious request it didn't retend uh, is how you would execute that vulnerability. So uh, I think I'm gonna have one cut in here, but other than that, I think I did pretty good. I just wanted to run through this real quick. Um, again, if there's other vulnerabilities that you wanna see, please let me know. And don't forget, if you wanna hire me and my team to do your next SOC 2 penetration test, uh, you go to arsonsecurity.com. That's A-R-S-0-N-Security.com. You go to the contact page in the top right-hand side, you send me a message. I can't wait to talk to you. Cheers.